Uh, I want you to turn to the book of Proverbs, if you would. This is uh, a message God laid on my heart this week. And um, I want you to pay attention this morning to the, to the passages of Scripture that I'm going to give and what the Word of God says. Uh, I know everybody's got a doctrine about something. Everybody's got a doctrine about the second coming. Everybody's got a doctrine about um, the rapture. Everybody's got a doctrine about uh, Jesus and salvation and the flood. And everybody's got a doctrine about this and a doctrine about that. What I'd like for you to do today is just forget about what you think you know and pay attention to the Word of God. Can you do that? I asked God years ago when I first started studying prophecy. Um, I think it must have been, oh, probably 1999, year 2000, something like that. I said, God, help me to forget everything that I think that I know. And then I want you to put it in me the way you want it in me. I don't like being wrong. I don't like being proven wrong. And so I want to be as accurate as I possibly can when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to our doctrine, what we believe, what we don't believe. And... Um, so anyway, I just want you to keep that in mind this morning. This message, of course, deals with the idea of backsliding. Now, I'm not going to ask you this morning uh, if you are in a backslidden state. Um, that's a hard thing to admit. I'm going to ask you, though, however, just between you and the Lord, without raising your hand, without uh, shouting, without trying to gain any attention for yourself, I'm going to ask you the question, where, where do you stand with God right this moment? Are you near to Him? Is He near to you? Or have you moved away from Him what, what he stands for, what he is, who he is, how he is. Are you with him? Or do you find yourself chasing other things and then you turn around and look for God? And he's way off in the distance. Let me tell you, that isn't because God moved away from you. It is because you moved away from God. I heard this uh, from Brother Lonnie Burks down at the Oak Lane Free Will Baptist Church. Uh, we go down there, try to go down there about every year for their camp meeting. And uh, Brother Lonnie started seeing it. Other preachers started seeing it. They're still part of the denomination. And um, he said, Mike, he said, I used to see it as us moving away from the denomination and the things that they're doing. He said, but now I'm convinced that all we did was stand still on the things that we believed in and didn't move, and the whole denomination left us. And that's exactly how it happens. And uh, so if you're going to stand for God... Stand for the Bible, stand for grace, stand for the blood, stand through for salvation, stand for the, for the rapture, stand for the uh, second coming of Christ, stand for all of these things that God has taught us in the scriptures. If you're going to stand those things and then you see people that you called brethren, people that you called sisters, churches that you thought were right with God, churches that were... Uh, that you fellowship with at one point, you see them way, 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 way far away, 
It's not that you moved away from them. It's just that they moved away from you. And more than likely, they're not coming back. Not coming back. I remember several years ago, I made a video called uh, The Emerging Church. And it really caught a lot of people's attention. I made that video down at Brother John Uter's church, uh, recorded it down there. And um, when we got back, uh, I don't know how they found out, but over here at First Baptist, uh, Dr. Adams was leaving there. And I had known him for a little while, had a crush on his daughter at one time. And um, I, I always felt like he was a godly man, a good preacher, so on. Didn't really see anything that bothered me out of him as a, as a young teenager. And um, so anyway, a few times their music director uh, asked me to join in on some of their Christmas things because I played multiple instruments. They asked me to play uh, trombone and euphonium Matthew one year for a little Christmas deal that they were having a Christmas concert. And so I enjoyed it. I knew several of the people over there. I went to school with them. I went to school with some of the teachers. And what happened was Dr. Adams retired and they got a new preacher in there. And he all of a sudden was going to make all these sweeping changes in the church. He went and told, Alicia, he went and told Dennis Nall, who was the music director, the choir director over at First Baptist, he, the pastor told him, we're no longer in need of your services. We're going to disband the choir. Well, Mr. Nall came to me, Melissa, and said that he was basically put out. One day, boom, the pastor came to him and said, we're not in need of your services anymore. We're doing everything different. And uh, I may have given him a video or whatever. Next thing I know, Mr. Templeton's coming over here. He was a member over there, him and his wife. And he said, I heard that you got some videos of what's happening in the churches nowadays. I said, you better believe I do. And I handed him probably 20 videos. Well, they went to passing them things around. And all of a sudden, a bunch of people from First Baptist left that church. They saw what that preacher was doing. They said, they're not going to do that while we're here. And if they won't let us stay here, then we're going to move out. We're going to start us another church. And that's exactly what they did. And when they started that church, they put a sign up that said, Southern Traditional. They wanted everybody to know, we're still going to follow the old paths. That's how we're going to do it. Uh, Lynn, you know what church I'm talking about. And then they did the same thing with uh, a church there in Lebanon. There was a Baptist church there in town that was doing the exact same thing. They were going to, they were going to, uh, had a money program going. They were going to try to raise up about 20, 15, 20 million dollars so they could move out of the building because it looked like a church. So let's build us a building that doesn't remind everybody of a church. And that way they won't be offended and we won't, we'll, 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 we'll sort of sneak the gospel into them. They won't know about it and uh, we'll fool everybody. And we're not a church. We're not religious. Uh, we're just here to have a good time in the Lord. And that's what they were going to do. And when people started passing around, John started, hand, John was their mailman. And John was giving out copies of my video in their mailboxes. And all of a sudden, people wanted more. And John, I started sending John more and more and more and more. Well, at some point, their pastor preached the don't listen to Mike Hoggard sermon. And what you had was, you had a bunch of backsliders that were playing church. And God wasn't in it. Notice this first verse I have up on the screen. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. The first reason why somebody backslides is because they are filled 
to the brim with the old ways of doing things, their own sins that they, they said they were sorry for, but down deep in their heart, they still wanted them. We had a man in this church years ago. I really looked up to him. Really liked him. Thought he was a good guy. All of a sudden, he had kind of fallen out of church. He ended up in the hospital. Preacher Golf and I went over to see him. And when we walked in and came around the curtain that he was behind in his bed, he started scurrying to hide the Playboy magazine that he had on his desk. My heart just sunk. See, that sin was always there. Never really left. And instead of begging God, God, take this from me. Get this far away from me. I don't want to be this way anymore. By the way, he ended up leaving his wife. Can you imagine that? How many children did he have? You don't know who I'm talking about? Mark? About four children? And the sweetest wife? The backslider in his heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Let's pray. Father, I need your blessings on this message. Father, I ask you, Lord, to give these people patience as they long suffer with me this morning. Lord, I want the message more than anything to ring true in our hearts. Teach us great and mighty things that we know not. Bless us to, today, Father. If any, if any one of us, whether they're here or online, finds himself in a backslid condition, Father, would you help them? Would you encourage them? Would you bless them? And bring them back, Lord, to the good old ways. Help us, dear God, as Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind. Let us go forward, press toward the mark for the prize and the high calling in Christ Jesus. Father, we just ask God that you bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. In Jeremiah 3, 6, I'm just going to read some verses for you very quickly. The Lord has said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Is backsliding a real thing? Well, your Bible says it is. Your Bible says it is. And again, I, I'm just asking you just for a little while to suspend what you think you believe or what you think you know about Bible doctrine. And I just want you to look at your Bible. Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree and there hath played the harlot. Now there's two meanings to this. Number one, a man or a woman can be in a church, sitting in the church pew, teaching Sunday school, playing the piano, singing in the choir, singing on the praise team, Doing things for the church, part of the ladies auxiliary, part of the nursery workers. She could be all of that in a church, and yet she could be having affairs behind the church's back, behind her husband's back, doing all of these things, hiding it well, and when she comes to church on Sunday, everybody thinks she's 
Oh, she's a good, she's a sweet little Christian. Boy, I just love her. Man, I get, I just love, she's just got God's, uh, God's blessing written all over her. I just like to be around her. And yet, what she's doing, she's playing the harlot every time she walks out of church. She's got a list of phone numbers on her phone. She's got apps on her phone to help her find new boyfriends that just want to get have a fling together just for a little bit. They don't, they don't want to move in with each other. They just want to have a little fling and then move on and have another one with somebody else. Women do that. Men do that. Pastors, pastors, after church service, getting on their, which by the way, the, I guess the bigger the crowd you get, Brother George, the less services you have. That's what I've noticed. Is that if you get you a crowd going of about a thousand, two thousand, three thousand people, why, wow, that pastor can't be bothered by preaching sermons all week. So they'll do two services on Sunday. Sunday at 10, Sunday at 12. He preaches the same message twice. Doesn't do anything else except for play a little golf the rest of the week. Gets paid about $300,000 a year or a month. And that's, that's all that man does. And he gets out of the service and he can't wait hardly to hook up with one of his girlfriends. Hook up with one of those gals on, that, on them apps that he's got on his phone. The backsliders will always play the harlot. The second part that is, is that they're playing spiritual harlotry. Which means that God says, I've, uh, uh, John, uh, excuse me, Paul said, I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin before Christ. And that's what the Bible is trying to do is present us holy before Jesus Christ. And yet these preachers and these people, they go out and they've turned their back against God. They are worshiping the devil. Turn their back away from God. And they're playing spiritual harlotry against God. They talk about God in the message. They talk about God in the service. They talk, oh, good. Oh, it's good to see you, brother so and so. Oh, I've been praying for you. God bless you this week. Oh, it's so good. Can't hardly wait to see you next week. Boy, we're gonna, we're gonna have a good time in the Lord. And the whole week, They've been spending playing the harlot under every tree all week long. Two verses down from Jeremiah 3, 6 to Jeremiah 3, 8. He said, I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. You see, Judah was the little sister who should have seen what God did to the big sister and said, uh-oh, if that's what God does, we better straighten up or God will do that to us or maybe even worse. But they didn't straighten up, did they? And what did God do? He got them worse. In Numbers chapter 14. I've said this before, I think I said it last week. The whole history of Israel from Egypt all the way to Canaan land is filled with story after story after story of the Israelites wanting to turn back and go back to Egypt where there's safety, where there's food, where they won't get in trouble. They won't be chased anymore. Now, now they're going to go back to slavery. But what they're saying is. We would rather have slavery. Than freedom. 
Now you might pardon me for just a moment. But let me tell you something I see wrong in our country. Abraham Lincoln gave his life to set the black man free in this country. He paid for that with his own life. Dr. Martin Luther King said this, that we ought to judge men on the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. He also lost his life for that. These men would be turning over in their graves if they could see what's happened now. You see, because any time you place yourself and the entirety of your life, your welfare, and your children's welfare over to the government, you are right back in slavery. So you're getting your rent paid, you're getting your daycare paid, you're getting your health care paid, you're getting your food paid for, you're getting everything paid for, plus you're getting a, a welfare check. And the more things that you get from the government at some point, somebody on the other end of the strings are going to tie them all together and you're going to realize that you are back in the same... No, you are one in, under worse chains than you were before. That's bondage. You know what that is? That's going back. That's not going forward. That's going back. Numbers chapter 14 verse 1 And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried and the people wept that night and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation said unto them Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt or would God we had died in this wilderness and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey were it not better for us to return into Egypt Did you see what that just said? It would be better for us to go back to slavery than it would for me, would for us to be free out here. That's what they're saying. And they said one to another, let us make us a captain. Let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And that kind of junk is going to lead into more and more and more bondage. Back Even back years ago when George Bush was president. And he promised that there would be programs given to the private and to the Christian schools. That would enable them to uh, uh, ha have more funds to run their school and things like that. We had a Christian school at the time. And you know what I said? I ain't, I ain't applying for none of that junk. Because there's got, I guarantee you, they get you hooked on that money, and then all of a sudden you can't go on without it. And then they start tying strings to it and saying, this is what you have to do in order to keep this money coming in. Did you know it's against the Constitution for the federal government to run the local schools? Did you know that? So you know how they do it? They offer federal money to the local school districts and when the school districts and the teachers union says we want that money it gets them tied in then to f federal programs my mother used to be the lunch lady 
And when Michelle Obama created this nonsense school lunch program where these kids were eating junk and garbage because the local school district took the money. And when they took the money, they found out that they had to feed these children this junk that those kids were never going to eat. Can you imagine trying to get a five-year-old child to eat hummus? Isn't that what they were feeding them? Do you know what my mom's job was? Scraping off all the hummus and all the food that the kids did not eat. And it was the biggest waste ever in school lunch history. Shoot, when they had me in public school, they never wasted nothing. I went around eating everybody's everything. Until they, they gave us prunes one time, and I went around eating everybody's prunes, and then I found out one day that's not a wise thing to do. <laughs> but you see, because the federal government promised all this money, all these schools had to eat Michelle Obama's junk. And God bless them, there was one school that said, we'll raise our own money for our lunches, but we're not buying that junk. But let's go back to Egypt. And be, let's be honest for a minute. Have you not at times thought that it was better in Egypt than what you're going through now? Brian and Pam, bless their heart. They've both been trying hard to live clean, sober lives, and it's not easy. So the devil said, watch this. And in my mind, it could very well be possible this is an attempt to draw them both back into the life that they used to live. You don't think Roy struggled with that since Bonnie died? Every day. He told us one time he was going to pull into the gas station and get him a bottle. And God made him pull into the hospital parking lot and just sit there and think about it for a while. And then he left. But going back to Egypt's real, people. It's real. In Numbers 21, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people di uh, uh, of Israel died. You see, you get to wanting the bread of the old days. Boy, remember, remember how good that wine tasted? Boy, you remember how good that, that vodka tasted? Whatever it is that you like to drink. My dad's was 905. About the cheapest beer you could find in St. Louis. But for some reason, he liked it. And he bought that junk. And couldn't stop. Until one day, the Lord intervened. And said, Don, knock it off. And he did. And he decided right then and there, I'm not going back to Egypt ever again. It's not worth it. I don't care how good the bread is. I don't care how good the beer tastes. I don't care how nice looking the women are. I'm not going back to Egypt. 
But that's what Israel was thinking about. Jeremiah 7 verse 24, but they hearkened not nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Backward. That direction, backward, takes you back to the days before you met Jesus. Takes you back to the days when getting high was actually felt good. When getting drunk actually felt good. When having girls hanging all over you, that, that felt real good. Having, the, having uh, a lot of men looking at you. Those were the glory days, the beauty days. And you want to go back to that and back to that same lifestyle and back to that same thing. There's a picture, you can find it on the internet, called the Million Dollar Quartet. Who's ever heard of that picture? Million Dollar Quartet. All four of these guys showed up at Sun Records one night in Memphis, Tennessee. Sun Records is, is the guy that gave Elvis, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Carl Perkins their start in music. And all four of those men got their start in gospel music. Jerry Lee was cousin to Jimmy Swagger. Johnny Cash wanted to make a gospel album. The guy from Sun Records talked him out of it. Carl Perkins was there. What, what, I can't remember what song he came up with. So we had an Elvis, whose mom was a dedicated church lady. All got their start singing in churches, singing in the choir, singing gospel music. And they walked out of that. All of them got into drugs, got into drinking, got into immorality. Elvis finally hired him a doctor that would, just like Michael Jackson, that would give him the drugs that he wanted. And he overdosed on him, killed him. Michael Jackson, the same thing. They may have at one point, may have wanted to do things right. But the old life kept calling them back. And they turned back and they all went to Egypt. And every one of them died and paid for it. Well, I think Jerry Lee's still alive. Jeremiah 11, 10, and they turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. They all turned back to their sins. John 6, 6, 6. I always believed that that was in that place for a reason. It says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. You know what? If you're a Jew and you're following Jesus, but then you decide to go back, you know what you go back to? Moses. You go back to Moses and look to Moses for salvation. Moses cannot give you salvation. Moses couldn't even get into the promised land himself. That's how wicked he was. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Perdition is hell. Of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And I'm asking you this morning, which side are you on right now? Or do you find yourself right now moving away from 
the gospel of grace through faith. Or are you still on the road to heaven who believe in the saving of the soul by faith? Which one are you? In Genesis 19, this is Lot. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of the heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities. And that which uh, grew upon all the ground. Look at verse 26. But his wife looked what direction? Back. From behind him, she became a pillar of salt. So here they are. They're, they're walking and they're leaving Gomorrah or Sodom. And his wife is going. All her friends are there. All the things that she loves is there. Her little house is there. And because of that, God knowing her heart instantly turned her into a pillar of salt. And there she stood as a testimony of those who all they did was look back. Now, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 15, we're going to change the story a little bit. Because remember, Naomi has two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and um, Orpah. It's where Oprah Winfrey got her name. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people, unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and, and more also, if, I, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Ruth had her heart right with God. She wasn't going to be like Orpah who turned around and went back to the old gods and the old ways. I'm going to get me another man. I'm going to have me a bunch of kids. Ruth decided, you know what? I think these Israelite people, I think they've got the right God. And wherever they go, I'm going with them. I'm not going to leave them. You know, the, the big picture of that story is this. I want everybody to listen to me. Look up here and listen. If you think that you're in the right church today, don't leave. Because we're here to help one another get to glory. Amen? That's what we're here for. One of you is having a bad day. You come to the house of the Lord. Bring that bad day in here with you. And when the preacher preaches, you take that bad day, you lay it down here on one of these mourners' benches and say, when I get up, I'm leaving it down here. I ain't going to carry that around anymore. And I need God's people to pray with me. Somebody say amen. By the way, that, there is nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you whatsoever. If you're sitting in the pew and all of a sudden God starts dealing with you and you said, man, I can't take it no more. Can't take it no more. Can't take no more. JR, come here. Pray with me, son. Come on. Come on. Pray with me. Would you get up? JR, I need you to pray with me. Will you pray with me, son? Let's pray. Let me tell you what I'm praying about. I, I ain't going to tell everybody what we're praying about. Thank you, JR.
Who in here volunteers in front of everybody right now that if somebody wants you to pray with him, you'll get up and go pray with them. Raise your hand. You can, all, you can go all the way up the balcony if you want to and grab John. Amen. 1 Samuel 15. Look at Saul. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, Repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he had turned back from following me. You know, when Saul became king, he preached along with the prophets. Later on, after he'd already turned his back from God, did you know that Saul preached again? You know how he did it then? Totally naked. Totally naked. You know why? He didn't have the Holy Spirit in him. And what happened was, in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, I will be his father. Oh, this is, this is not it. Where's, where's the verse I want? Yeah, here it is. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. That's what made Saul go out and preach totally naked. Naked's a type of shame. And if you are naked and not ashamed, that means your mind has been turned over to a reprobate mind. Let me, uh, let's see here. Jeremiah 14, 7. O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for thy name's sake, and for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. How hard would that be for you to pray today? O Lord, our iniquities testify against us. Do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. Thee. Would that be easy for you to pray? You'd have to admit to it. O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and bring you into Zion. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Hosea 14, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. If you find yourself in a backslidden state, I'm here to tell you that maybe, just maybe, you haven't gone too far. And that God can bring you back. Raise your hand if God has ever brought you back from a backslidden state. Somebody say amen. I'm done. See, when you see that, that means it's over with. Bow your heads this morning.